Summit Church. We are so excited to be here with you tonight. Whether you've been here your hundredth time or whether this is your first time, we're so excited just to be in the same room together and worshiping our Savior. If you are able, please stand with us and we're going to start off our time with some worship. Thank you. 
My name is Maddie Phelps, and I'm so excited to be with you tonight. Our next song has a line, and it says, you've been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. God, you do great things. And I was sitting there in Drango Coffee Shop with my pumpkin spice latte, and I was watching the rain, and I was like, man, what a cool reminder of God's faithfulness and love for us. We're so fortunate to live in a world and in a place where we're constantly reminded of that and that we can live in knowing that God does great and amazing things for us.
wake us up on a day like this with the sun in the morning, the rain in the afternoon, and Lord, we just thank you for your power, the strength and courage that you give us to go through these days, <clears throat> whether we're down in our dumps or whether we're on the top of that mountain. Lord, we pray that you're with us and you're watching over us. We thank you for uh, being with all of us here today and all of us online and around the world. We also ask that you be with the women at the retreat and let them find you there and always go deeper with you. Help us to always continue to seek you first, love you always, and just laugh with everyone around us. And we pray all of this through your son Jesus, the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, hey, it's great to be with you in worship. My name is Jeff Huber. I'm lead pastor here at Summit Church, and we're grateful that you're here with us. Uh, our prayer always is that you would be in, empowered and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. And uh, today, as we gather, if it's your first time with us, we have something called a QR code. It's up on the screen, and we invite you to take a picture of that. It'll take you to our digital connect card, and that's our way of uh, connecting with you. And if you fill that out, uh, we will make a donation in your name to our food ministry, and we are just excited to uh, partner with you right away and be the presence of Jesus together. And our food ministry, one of our main things uh, we're doing this year is helping out with the Mana Backpack Program. And a lot of you are going to Mana on Thursdays or Wednesdays. You're pa we're packing them Thursdays. Uh, we have folks going and driving and taking to schools because we have kids that don't have enough to eat over the weekends. And so you get to be a part of that. It's really an awesome thing to do together. But whether you've been here once or many times, our hope always is once again you would know that you're not alone that the Holy Spirit longs to meet you here, and there are others who are part of the a body of Christ together. So if you're willing, would you just turn and give people a welcome, a handshake, a hug, a word of encouragement, whatever way you're comfortable, just ahead of the folks around you. If you're online with us, let's just check in there and let us know you're with us. We'd love to connect with you there as well. Hi everyone, welcome to Summit Church. We are so glad that you're here with us this weekend. As always, you can find the most up-to-date information on our website at summitdurango.org. And our app is changing. With our new software system, we have a new app called Church Center. So you can look at the screens and it'll show you how to do it. Or after the service, if you need help with any of it, the two of us, oh yeah, will be out ready to help you, get it downloaded or answer any questions that you might have. We're really excited. This will make it a lot easier for you to connect with everything that's going on in the church. Now let's take a moment and prepare our hearts for the message. It's okay to admit we've been hurt, overlooked, rejected, and misled by people we placed our trust in. That doesn't make us weak or incapable. Rather, with every question, every opportunity to quit, in our weakness, we see the power of God. For when we are most weak, God is strong. The only thing that can stop us from doing what God has called us to do is if we quit and let our questions become louder than the cross and let our guilt grow louder than the grave. God's grace is sufficient. Let that promise rest over you. So uh, when we lived in Denver, uh, my wife uh, did her student teaching at a, uh, a school that was predominantly Hispanic school, kind of in the middle of downtown Denver. And, uh, and over the course of the summer, they replaced the playground. In order to do that, they had to tear out the fencing, and they tore all the fencing out, they tore a playground out, and they put this new beautiful playground in for the kids, and it was awesome. Uh, it was a fun school for me to go visit. Uh, I was serving a church at the time, but I go, and, and the kids would be, Senior Jeff, Senior Jeff, they were great, they had a great time. And and, and when I got there at the beginning of the school year, it was fascinating because they had put this new playground in, but they hadn't put the fence in yet. And so all the kids were kind of playing, but they were all kind of huddled around the playground, just playing around the play set, you know, which was great because it was kind of some busy streets nearby and there were some teachers around, but, you know, kind of keeping them there. But for the most part, kids... And then what was interesting, about three weeks later, they put the fence in. And you know what happened? Kids played all the way to the edges. 
because they knew they were safe. And so they went all the way to the edge of the fence and they played. They were playing soccer. They, they weren't playing soccer or any of that the first few weeks. But man, once that fence was in, man, they felt safe. And today we're going to talk about that idea of what makes us feel safe. What are, what are the boundaries that we need to feel safe? And uh, this is a concept uh, I kind of learned uh, early on in ministry uh, from a book that I read called Boundaries. It's a New York Times bestselling book. It actually came out in 1992 with a different cover. And it's been reworked several times by uh, two people, uh, Cloud and Townsend. And, and they actually have uh, not only books for boundaries, but boundaries with kids, boundaries uh, for parents. They have a, a Boundaries for Leaders book that I've really appreciated and been helpful. And, and, and this idea of boundaries is really critical, I think, for us. And, and, and I think one way to kind of get a, a feel for this, how it works in our lives, is a, I love this story that uh, uh, Dr. Cloud tells at the very beginning of his book or when he's teaching on this. Because I have to tell you, I've been every person in this story, and I've had many, many people come and share with me pretty much the same story. Uh, about, about a family that comes to visit him. He's a counselor, a therapist, and his mother and father and, and two kids come. They're kind of in their 20s, the kids are. And, and the dad shows up and says, uh, um, I need you to fix my kid. By the way, I've happened to me a lot when I was a youth director. I need you to fix my kid. And that's always a little bit of a like, ooh, gosh, that's, that's, a, that's, that's a tall order a lot of times. And, and, and he says, well, tell me what's going on with your kid. And he said, well, my kid's got lots of problems. Um, he's been uh, smoking marijuana since he was 15. He's 23 now. So Dr. Cloud's saying, that's a long time. He's probably pretty mellow by now if he'd spoken pot that long. And, uh, and, and, then, and then he says, uh, and, and he's flunked out of college three times. And, um, and, and so then he turns to the young man. He says, boy, that does sound like big problems. And the, and the kid says, oh, that's not me. Uh, that's my brother you're talking about. My brother's, well, where's your brother? Well, he's not here. Why not? Well, he doesn't think he has any problems. So he's not here. And, and, and the dad says, no, you don't understand. He's got these, he smokes marijuana and, and, and he's flunked out of college three times and, and he's going on and on. And finally, Dr. Cloud says, well, you know, I don't understand. How do you flunk out of college three times? I mean, I get once. And he said, well, I didn't really have the grades to get in the first time, but I was on the board, so I got him in. And, and then um, he flunked out and, and, and the reason was because he was parting the dorms. So I bought him a condo. So then he could stay in the condo at a new, I got him into another school, he's in the condo, and, uh, and then he flunked out of that school, so I bought him a house and got him a car so he would not hang out with those folks, but he flunked out of that school too, and, and but at this point, Dr. Cloud's like, uh, well, uh, gosh, I, I, boy, it, it, it does sound like your son doesn't really have any problems. And, and the man says, well, what do you mean? Well, well, and he said, well, where is your son? Why isn't he here? He's like, well, he's in Vail. What's he doing in Vail? Well, he's skiing with friends. And, and Dr. Klaus says, well, clearly he has no problems. He's skiing in Vail. He's got a house. He's got a car. Things are going well for him. But you don't understand. And this is where you hear the pain of the dad. When I was his age, I had started three companies and every, you know, and, and he doesn't even have a major. He can't teach his school, you know. And, and Dr. Cloud looked at him and said, I'm sorry, but uh, I, I can't help your son. And I don't think he has any problems, really. And the dad says, what do you mean? He's got a drug problem. He's got, he's got a problem with, with get, staying in school. And finally, Dr. Cloud says, actually, I can't help your son, but, but I could help you because I think you're the one with the problems. And the dad said, I don't, I don't have these problems. And, 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 and Dr. Cloud said, well, clearly you do. You have a problem that your kid's doing drugs and he's doing all these things. And, and, uh, and I, th I think that's a you problem. Uh, plus, the truth is you're... you're Son isn't here to see me in the counselor's office, and you are. Do you know who comes to the counselor's office? People who have problems. He said, but I could help you create some problems for your son. And really what he was describing was a problem with what we call boundaries. Uh, boundaries are very simply a property line. It's a property line be, that you really have around your space. Think of it as I have my space and you have your space. In this case, we have a parent who has space and we have a child who has space. And, and what often happens when it comes to boundaries is we forget that we are responsible for what's in our space and the other person is responsible for what's in their place. What's interesting is this is a very biblical concept. We find it over and over again in the scriptures. And, and boundaries do one thing. They define ownership. I have me and my stuff, and you have you and your stuff. When I meet with couples to do pre-marriage work, 
One of the first things I do is I say, let's talk about some of your issues because you have to figure out your issues before you dump them on somebody else. And you have to claim and own your stuff. So what's your stuff? And because I have my stuff, you have your stuff. And by the way, I'm preaching this sermon to me as much as I'm to anybody else because I get boundaries messed up too sometimes. And this idea of ownership is it, is it tells us what's ours and what's not ours. I have my stuff, you have your stuff. And the problem with boundaries is we often take responsibility for other people's stuff. And the problem with this parent and this child, this father and this son, is that the son had all these problems, but dad was taking them all on and trying to fix them. And folks, that never works. Not only that, it creates an unsafe environment for both the parent and the child and for once again, this happens in the church. Sometimes the, the, I have people that come and they say, Jeff, I need the church to fix this. And I'm like, well, now some churches try to fix stuff you don't want fixed. And that creates an unsafe environment. Part of what we need to do is be willing to claim, here's what my stuff and here's what your stuff. Because God's given us freedom. He's given us freedom to control, if you will, to be responsible for ourselves, our lives, this space, and this biblical idea is one that we cannot forget. By the way, the scriptures talk about in a text we read often, and we actually read a part of it last week, where in Galatians, Paul says to the people, the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We often forget about the self-control one, but the truth is you have control over a lot of stuff, a lot more stuff in your life than you think. And I have a lot more control than I think. And unfortunately, sometimes if I'm trying to control other people like my wife or my kids or the church or people in the church or my staff or whatever, I get myself into all kinds of problems. But then notice what he says next. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. In other words, our temptations to try to fix other people, where brokenness happens, we're trying to fix it all, all the time. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in our lives. Let us not be conceited or provoke each other or be jealous of one another. What oftentimes I find happens when we get our boundaries mixed up is because, well, we get a bit conceited and we think we can control other people. We can control their stuff. And so what I want to talk to you about today is how do we be clear on what's mine and what's not mine? Now, there is a time where it's appropriate to carry other people's burdens, to care for them, to, to, especially if they invite you in to, to, to encourage them. But also, if we're just barging into somebody else's space, what oftentimes happens is we take responsibility for stuff that's not ours. You see, one of the things boundaries does is it shapes responsibility. It makes clear what's mine and what's not mine? What belongs to someone else and what doesn't? And what really was happening in this story is what we call crisscross boundaries. They were all meshed up, all right? The parent and the child are, and all these, and he's taking, and, and I started this series of sermons, by the way. I don't know if you remember if you were here or not, but if not, I started it by talking about, um, I, I was doing a project in my house and I'm trimming some trees. So uh, let's say you have a property and you have space that's yours and you have your neighbors and I cut down a tree or work on a tree and it falls in their yard and it hurts somebody. Who's responsible? I am because it's my stuff. It fell on their yard and boundary damage happens when trees fall over. And here's what often happens in our lives if we're honest. People that we love and care about have an addiction or they have, um, they're doing some things that aren't good for them, or the, and we want them to change or be different. And what happens is that stuff spills over into our life, and we start to get hurt, partly because we haven't built a good boundary. That boundary damage can be painful. You know, um, the kid in the story, his issue around, you know, smoking, his issue around not going to school, his issue around not paying for his own stuff, all those things, uh, he wasn't feeling the pain of it. The dad was. Because the dad was kind of allowing it to happen. And part of boundaries is realizing that boundaries aren't mean. They help us all claim what's ours. Because here's the other unintentional thing we do. The other unintentional thing we do is when we take care of other people's problems and they haven't asked for it. Like, here's what the father is. And by the way, I've met with many families where this situation I just described to you is happening. <laughs> and I'll tell you. And here's what I tell them. I say, here's what I just want you to be aware of. 
what you're basically telling your son by basically providing, getting him into school, providing him his house, taking care of all of his stuff, you're basically telling him, I don't believe in you. I don't think you can handle life, so I'm going to take care of it for you. That's the other thing that happens with these boundaries if we're not careful, if we're not clear on what our boundaries are, what we have control over, and what, well, what belongs to others. You see, not studying drug use, the not going to work, all those problems are pouring into the life of the dad because he just hasn't figured out how do I, how do I draw a boundary around this? How do, I, how do I make sure that, you know, this? Now, here's the thing. God has given us boundaries in life. He has. God's given us freedom, but he's also given us boundaries. When we go beyond those, we get hurt or we hurt others if we're not careful. Those boundaries are, are really critical, if you will, because those boundaries set limits between what's mine and what's yours. And, and the consequences of a problem falling in the wrong place is damage hearts and lives, and I see it happen over and over and over again, and boundaries are meant to set limits. And when God sets limits, he does it with two things. He does it with grace and truth. Grace meaning God made us to love us, and that's great, but if all God does is love us and he just leaves us there, that's called codependency, by the way. If God just, you know, just loves us, loves us, and there aren't any limits, that's codependency. If God just sets limits, and that's all God does. It's God's a tyrant and kind of mean, but God does both. Let me give you an image, a way to think about this. How many of you have driven on uh, Red Mountain Pass? Some of you are going to do that this season, right? Because it's beautiful out, right? It's fall. Drive on Red Mountain Pass, and, uh, and so it looks like this. This is a warning sign, by the way, on the Department of Transportation. Keep your eyes on the road. Because that's what it looks like if you ever driven. If you haven't driven it, literally, there are sheer drop-offs, all right? Now, how do we drive safely from one end of the pass to the other, especially when there are beautiful fall colors? You have to stay within the what? Lines. There's lines on the road. On the right side, it's relatively easy for this person because there's a big cliff and a rock. I mean, there's a big mountain. On the left side, however, you know, the, part, the fact that they don't have uh, guardrails in this makes me a little nervous, right? But the truth is that there are lines. What if, what if you drive on the wrong side of the road on Red Mountain Pass? What's going to happen? Uh, someone's going to end up probably off the edge. I mean, there's going to be some damage that's caused. What if you close your eyes while you're driving? That you're going to end up in a world of hurt. The purpose of the lines on the road, the purpose of those guardrails when we have them on the steep road is to keep us safe. Just like the, the fence, the purpose is to keep the kids safe or in the playground. The purpose is to keep us moving forward, if you will. Those guardrails are there for a reason. God loves us and wants us to see the beautiful colors and the way the creation is changing. And God wants us to be safe. We need both. We need, if we don't have good boundaries, it causes pain and damage and hurt and destruction in people's lives. And, and the truth is that the scriptures talk about this constantly. Uh, the Apostle Paul puts it this way when he's talking to the early church in 1 Corinthians 6. He says, you say I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. And even though I'm allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. Uh, too often what I have seen in relationships is that um, we allow ourselves to become the slave of the other person. Uh, whether it's a parent who's mistreating us, or a child who's acting out, or a workplace environment where we allow sometimes the employees to rule us, or sometimes our boss to rule, we have a hard time. We become a slave if we're not careful, if we don't have a sense of boundaries, a sense of purpose, a sense of here's, here's who I am, and here's who you are, here's my stuff, and here's yours. And what often happens is we take responsibility for other people's stuff. But God wants us to have limits. Has this ever happened to you? Have you ever uh, had someone that you love or you care about? And they're doing some stuff and you're like, man, it's like watching a slow motion car crash. You ever see? And, and you're like, I can see it. I can see it coming. They're, like, they're on that. They're on Red Mountain Pass and their eyes are closed and they're going off the edge. I can see it coming. And what's, what do we want to do? We want to step in and we want to say, don't do it. Don't do it. But that never really works. It might save them for a moment, but eventually they're going to have to figure 
part of this stuff out. And, and so part of what we need to be willing to do is to recognize that God's, that the best thing we can do sometimes is to set a really clear boundary and be good at our own boundaries because that's what you have, that's what we have control over. Um, what makes the church a safe place is when we're clear on our boundaries, what we will do and what we won't do. By the way, I give you a practical example. Um, we have people come in here looking for assistance often, and we want to help them. But, you know, the scriptures also say very clearly that they have their work to do, and we have our work to do. And we are willing to help, but we have limits around that. Not because we don't care. Not because we're trying to be mean. But because if we don't have some sort of boundary, if you will, we either get walked all over or we're mean, one or the other. And neither one of those is good. What's interesting is the scriptures actually, and Jesus has a prayer he asks us to pray because he knows this is a human problem we have. Because what happens when you have your property line and someone else has theirs and they walk over onto yours and cause some damage? What's that called? Trespassing. And what do we pray every week? Forgive us our trespassing. Because we trespass all the time if we're not careful. And part of becoming like Christ, you know, the person who was great at boundaries was Jesus. He didn't, several times the devil comes to him at the beginning of his ministry and says, do this, do that, do this, do that. And he says, no, that's not, that's, that's outside the boundary. Uh, several times people come to him and he says to them, here's what you need to do. And they're like, I can't do that. And, and he's like, fine. That's outside the boundary. You see, the boundaries tell us what we're responsible for and also who we're responsible to. Because here's the thing. I'm responsible for me, but I'm responsible to that other person. So if that other person, if someone hurts me, I'm resp- I'm, I, need, I need to take responsibility and go to that person and say to them, hey, this was painful. This, this was hard. Um, once again, how often have you done this? Let's be honest. Someone hurts you, and you go talk to somebody else about it. You ever done that? All right, that's a violation of boundaries, uh, pure and simple, because what it does is it brings somebody else in, and their boundaries get all, and we get crisscrossed with the boundaries all the, Jesus says it very clearly, by the way, in Matthew 18, he gives us, uh, he basically gives us a way of going to, he says, if someone harms you, you go to them. And you say, hey, this was painful. And hopefully they go, oh, you know what? I'm sorry. Forgive me my trespassing. And and you move on. But if they don't recognize their part in it, it says, then you make the boundary stronger. And you bring in a couple more people to come in and hold a stronger boundary and say, hey, this wasn't right. And eventually it says what what Jesus says in Matthew. Do you know what he says? He says, um, eventually, if they don't respond, then... You put up a boundary that gives you some distance and you don't interact with them for a while. This is when I'm working with people in places of abuse or where there's severe addiction. You know, sometimes you need a physical concrete. You got to be separated from them to keep yourself safe. This is what families do when they do an intervention. They say, look, here's the boundary. And by the way, you and I it's okay for us to say to someone, I'm not going to let you in. It's too painful. That's okay. It's okay to do that. It's a, I mean, it, it, matter of fact, sometimes that's what's the best because people are so... Um, I'll have a couple come to me sometimes and uh, they have a marriage. It's just on the rocks. Maybe there's been an affair. There's maybe some addiction. There's abuse, something else. And here's what I will tell them. I will tell them, this marriage needs to end. You don't have to get divorced, but the marriage you're in right now, the way you're doing boundaries has to stop because you're just going to hurt each other. And this thing has to end. And so let's get some separation so then we can figure out how can we move forward together. Uh, by the way, this is talked about in the scriptures over and over and over again. Uh, let me suggest to you one of the places that we get messed up when it comes to boundaries is because instead of having empathy, we have sympathy. Here's what happens. Uh, something hard's going on in someone's life. And we're like, oh, that poor person. Da, 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 and we step into their world and we think we're going to fix it. And as a result, we get sucked in and pulled in. And if we don't figure out how to set some boundaries before we get to that place, it just kind of 
It just kind of wears us out if we're not careful. Um, in Leviticus, it's interesting. Um, these powerful words that we find in Leviticus 19. Don't twist justice in legal matters by favoring the poor or being partial to the rich and powerful. I'll ju- always judge people fairly. So don't, don't favor those who have very little and don't favor those who have a lot. Then what's interesting? Do not, and then these are boundaries. Don't spread slanderous gossip among your people. In other words, when you have an issue with someone, don't go to other people and talk to them about it, all right? Uh, don't stand idly by when your neighbor's life is threatened. In other words, sometimes it is appropriate to go and say, hey, how can I help you? Um, I am the Lord. He says, do not use hatred in your heart for any of your relatives. Confront people directly so you will not be held guilty of their sin. Isn't this interesting? If you go to people and you're not willing to front, confront them directly, basically you get held guilty for the brokenness. So go and be direct and don't seek revenge or bear or grudge against a fellow Israelite, but love your neighbor as yourself. This is the key. By the way, Jesus, by the way, when Jesus said love your neighbor as yourself, he was Jewish. He's quoting, right, this part of Leviticus because here's what he's basically saying. There's two things in this I really want you to notice. The first is this, love your neighbor as you would want to be treated. Would you want someone to come directly to you if they have a problem with you? My guess is you would. You wouldn't want them talking to other people about it, would you? No. Um, would you want people barging into your life and offering you advice and telling you how to live your life? Probably not. Not unless you invite them. But then the second thing I want you to notice is this. I am the Lord. You see, one of the hallmarks of our faith is boundaries between us and each other, but also between us and God. We're not pantheists. We don't believe a God is everywhere and everything. We believe we have the image of God in us, but we are not God. I'm not God. You're not God. We have a God who is separate from us. Our God created creation, all this beautiful stuff. You're going to see the colors changing. God is separate from that and created that and created us. And so there's a boundary actually between us and even God. I'm not God. There's another way that Jesus talks about this, which I love. It's one of my favorite um, things about Jesus. And it's one of my favorite ways he draws a boundary. When he comes upon someone who is sick, he doesn't just heal them. He waits for them to ask. Or sometimes people are brought to him by others, by friends. And do you know what he says? He says these words. Do you want to get well? Do you realize that there's a there's a boundary here because here's what, we're, here's what we learn in this, that God will do God's part. Jesus is going to do his part, but I have to do my part too. I'm responsible too for saying, I want to get well. I want to get healed. I'm going to give you a very practical way of thinking about this, okay? I'm, I have my hip replaced um, in October. I'm pretty honest. At the end of October, I got my right one done five years ago. I can get my left one done, all right? And I just went for my pre-op, and I have this whole packet of things I have to do before the surgery, um, one of them are all these wonderful little exercises, which I do for you right now if you want to see them. But my point is, I have stuff I have to do. I mean, I have a good surgeon. He's going to operate on me, and he's going to do a great job because he did a great job last time. But if I don't do my work ahead of time, the surgery probably won't go very well. One of the things they make you do, by the way, I have to go in and get blood work and do, I have to do all, and then, this is the best part, I have to take a shower with this stuff. Three days before, so I don't get some sort of infection during the surgery. So I have to, if I don't do that, I could get an infection. I have my part I have to do. And then when the surgery is over, I'm going to be in the hospital room the next day, and the nurse is going to come in and say, all right, Jeff, time to get up. And what if I said, I don't want to, it hurts too bad. You know what she would say? Too bad your insurance only covers you for this day. Get your rear end out of bed and get moving. You have your part to do. You see, it doesn't do us any good to just do stuff for people. Yes, there are moments where, by the way, there's a difference between a burden. When someone has a burden, that means it's too much for them. And hopefully they invite you into that. And it says carry each other's burdens, but but we're not supposed to just barge in and, and fix people, fix things. Because boundaries are meant to help us actually do you realize one of the things boundaries does is it makes us better. It helps us become the people God wants us to be because boundaries also do this. They keep the good stuff in and they keep the bad stuff out. You see, one of the things that we're meant to have boundaries for is because 
hey, um, any of you have tapes playing in your head from when you were younger that you just don't want anymore? Part of our challenge is to build a boundary around that and say, I don't want that. And we allow the good stuff in like God made me to love me. I want to leave that in. And you know what? God loves you enough. God loves you just where you are. And God loves you enough not to leave you there. And so the truth is that boundaries help us see what we can become. God has hopes and dreams for all of us. And this is one of the things that boundaries are meant to do. They're meant to help. And your memory verse this week, by the way, it really captures this. It's in Proverbs. Um, it's these powerful words. If you're willing, would you say them together with me out loud? They're on your meditation moments you'll get this week if you download them or if you get them sent to you. Read it with me if you wouldn't mind. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Guard your heart. That means it's a boundary thing. Guarding your heart's about. Ba- I'm going to keep the good stuff in and the bad stuff out. Folks, when you, at your property, where you, you know, at my house, I have walls, I have a boundary. You know why I have that boundary? Uh, to keep the bears out, right? I have the doors closed, you know, and I want to keep them out and I want to keep the good stuff, my family and others in and keep them safe. You see, sometimes we forget that boundaries are meant to once again be a gift. I love the way David talks about it. You know, David talks a lot about being chased down and trying to guard himself and his people himself. And in Psalm 100, he says, I will sing of your love and justice, Lord. I will praise you with songs, but I will reject perverse ideas and stay away from the evil things. I will not tolerate people who slander their neighbors. I'm going to keep those people out. I will not endure conceit and pride. I will search for faithful people to be my companions. So I keep the bad out. Bring the good in. Only those who are above reproach will be allowed to serve me. I will not allow deceivers to serve in my house, and liars will not stay in my presence. There's this strong sense in the scriptures, keeping the good stuff in and the bad stuff out. That's why we need boundaries. You and I, we all need those things. And sometimes, once again, we have to increase our boundaries. But you know what the thing is? Boundaries aren't walls. They aren't. They're like doors and windows. So sometimes in your life, you want to open the door. And let somebody in, let somebody's heart in, you know, you want. but sometimes you're like, I, I can't let that person in, it, it's, it will hurt me, and it will hurt my family, or why not, I mean, this is the reason, uh, boundaries, once again, are, they're not these, per- and sometimes uh, boundaries are, well, they're temporary, and sometimes I've worked with many people who have to build a permanent boundary because of hurt they've experienced from someone else. They just can't let that person in. Here's another thing I want to just remind you of today is that when Jesus gives us all these instructions for how to deal with conflict, when he says, go to people, and then he says, if they're not willing to hear you, take some folks, build a bigger boundary, and eventually he says, build a bigger one. Here's what he says at the end of that story when he tells us how to deal with conflict in Matthew 18. He says, to tell you the truth, Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. And whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Do you realize this life is practice? This life is practice. Because because I think one of the things that we forget too easily is that um, uh, boundaries are meant to tell us who we are and whose we are, that we belong to God. Last week we talked about our identity being in Christ. Your identity is in Christ, not in what other people say about you. It's in who G- is it? Last week we talked about politics. Your identity is not in being a Republican or a Democrat or some other uh, thing. You know, it's, it's, it's in Christ. And one of the reasons we get all out of whack in our boundaries is we forget to be settled in Christ. One of the things that Jesus said, it's okay to say yes and it's okay to say no. <laughs> I love this phrase of Dr. Clouds. No is a complete sentence. Sometimes it's just, you know, no, I, I need to, it's hard for us. And by the way, this is hard for me as a pastor. I mean, I'm, you know, I, I care about people. I got into this because I care about people and, and all that. But, but sometimes I got to say no. And I, I look back, I think back to that father and that son and, and that story I started with. You know, it's hard to say no sometimes to people that we love. But we're, we're not trying to destroy them. We're just trying to set a boundary to help us and them. I love the way Jesus puts it. Just say a simple yes, I will, or no, I won't. Anything beyond this is from the evil one. In other words, it's not about a lot of maybes and all that. Um, But I want to remind you of, once again, what the fruits of the Spirit are. Fruits of the Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, 
self-control. My hope and prayer for you, for us, is that we would find a way to be okay with who we are and have a boundary that enables us. You see, all of us are called to be prudent. The proverb says, a prudent per- person foresees danger, takes precautions, builds a boundary. A simpleton goes blindly, suffers the consequences. The scriptures talk over and over again about this idea. So let me just give you a list of things that you're responsible for in your life and I'm responsible for in my life. We're responsible for our feelings, for our attitudes. You're responsible for your behaviors, for your choices. You and I are responsible for our values, you know. My values, part of them are the fruits of the Spirit. Our values come from our faith, right? We're responsible for that. Saying, you know what? I can't be with this person because their values don't align and that's causing me harm to be with them. We're responsible for building the limits. Do you realize that a big part of the thing you're responsible for is your talents, the things you're good at? You're responsible for your thoughts, what you think about. I'm responsible for my desires. I'm responsible for the love that I share with others and the love I receive. I mean, too often we give other people the power by allowing them to be responsible for those things. God says, you, you I, cre- I made you to love you and I gave you the ability to have responsibility, to have control and to build boundaries. My hope and prayer is you would know that because having boundaries really is stewardship. It's about literally saying, this is mine and that is yours, and God gave me this thing, me, to to take care of myself, to be a gift to the world. So once again, I want to remind you of this proverb. If you're willing, would you say it together with me? Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. I love, uh, once again, the fact that Jesus and Paul tell us to care for others. And so I want to end just by reminding you that there's a difference between a burden and the fact that, you see, when, you get, when we get our boundaries right, then we have, we're full and we can help care for others. I love the way Paul puts it once again when he says, share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. If you think you're too important to help someone, you're only fooling yourself. You're not that important. But then, listen to what he says next. Pay careful attention to your own work. We all have our own work to do, for then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done, and you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else. You know what a lack of boundaries does? It makes you compare yourself to everybody else. You're always in everybody's stuff, for we're each responsible for our own conduct. So let me leave you with a question. Or do you see some boundary crisscrossing in your life? When I was preparing this sermon, I got to tell you, about every fifth sentence I wrote, I'm like, oh, <laughs> I got I to deal with this. Oh, gosh. My guess is, as we've talked about this, as I've shared some of these biblical ideas about boundaries, you're probably have gone, oh, don't beat yourself up. Just kind of take note of it and ask yourself, hmm. What could I, and by the way, this may take seeing a counselor. I have a counselor I see. It helps me tremendously. It may take, uh, maybe you get the book. Once again, there's one for boundaries with kids, boundaries with parents. There's boundaries for leaders. I found all of them to be helpful. But what I know is they all have to start somewhere. So what's the one step you might take today? Is there an area where there's some crisscrossing of boundaries in your life? And might God be speaking to you today through this message of these scriptures to guard your heart and be the person that God knows and has created you to be. My prayer is that we will discover safe boundaries in our most important relationships in our church because here's the ultimate boundary issue. One of these days, you're going to take your last breath here. Remember, boundaries aren't walls. And you will leave this life, take a last breath, and then you'll enter into the kingdom of heaven. And the question is, have we taken care of ourselves and guarded our hearts so we're ready for that moment and we can let go here and receive 
that beautiful thing that God has in store for us. Because here's what I want to tell you. When we do that here, we experience the kingdom of heaven here. And we're ready for what is not yet. That's why Jesus said the kingdom of God is now. And it's not yet. I pray you'll discover safe boundaries in your life, ways that you can receive that gift today. Let's pray. God, this idea of boundaries is hard for us. Many of us struggle with them. I know I do. It's challenging to remember that we can't fix or take care of everyone else, and we can't expect others to fix us. You've given us freedom to, to own our feelings, our attitudes, our thoughts, our behaviors, our desires, our love. Help us to live into them, to choose healthy boundaries in the days ahead that help us to love you, to love others, and to love ourselves well for you and for your kingdom. We ask and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So uh, I want to thank you for your offering. Uh, It makes possible um, just a lot of the ministry that we do here. One of them is we have this new kind of system of way of staying connected that's out there, and and, uh, it's called Church Center. And uh, you can give online, you can give on the app, there's physical places to give, but, but this will help you stay connected to the church and, and to other folks in the church. It's all secure and private and all that. You can find out more about it by scanning the QR code, it'll be up on the screen around out in the welcome area. But I hope you do that because this also will help you get the meditation moments. And by the way, now, if you weren't here last week, we launched this new things you can text med moments to this number it's up on the screen we have some back it's on the med moments now on our website and then every day you're going to get these scriptures we looked at today a lot of them and be able to really and some questions about things to reflect upon and be able to pray over those things i hope you will um, use that because we care about you we want to help you grow into uh, the person god longs for you to be right now let's if you're able let's respond by singing and standing together or singing together our closing song
love us enough to not only have boundaries with us, but to teach us boundaries. We thank you for loving us so greatly and so deeply. And we pray this in your name, in the words of your son who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Hey, as we leave, we want you to know that we care about you. You know, we kind of been talking about heavy stuff this whole series. And if something's come up for you, and maybe there's areas where you're struggling with some boundaries or relationship, uh, we have one of our care ministers here. But you can look for the folks with the white lanyards around the building. You can also go on our website. There's a place where you can fill out kind of a prayer request. And you could just send a note to, uh, to us. And we'd love to maybe connect with you outside of this space. And we'd love to connect with you after the service. Uh, we have an area uh, out on the left called the Wesley Commons. Uh, we have coffee in there. And um, you saw... Uh, um, Kelsey, our youth director, on the opening video, on the back of her shirt is this QR code for our new app. It's called the Church Center app, and it's really simple to put it on. You put your phone number in there, it sends you a security code, and you're ready to go. And you can you can download sermons and messages and med moments and register for things. I mean, it's a it's an awesome new tool. I hope you'll you'll really consider connecting with us in that way. So I want to end with this um, as we leave today. Um, one of the reasons we're doing this series of sermons is because we have a lot of folks who feel like the church is not a safe place. And one of the reasons a lot of people feel that way is because I would suggest to you as a church, we violate our boundaries sometimes. We sometimes literally push ourselves into other people's lives and judge them or, you know, we basically it's a boundary violation to go over there and say, you should do this and you should do that. Nobody likes to, you know, be should on. These people don't like that, all right? And so good boundaries are recognizing that this is who we are. This is, the other thing I've discovered is when we are putting ourselves in other people's spaces, we're forgetting to take care of our own. And I think it gets pretty frustrating when we recognize, and this is what I was really convicted by this week, I need to work on me. I need to work on not crisscrossing boundaries, on having good boundaries for me and for my relationship with God. And I pray that that will help you have a relationship with God that is deep and rich and meaningful. And then you have something to go out and take into the world. I pray you will discover that in the days ahead as you wrestle with this idea and understand that God made you to love you and to be a part of his kingdom. Go in peace and serve God. And the people of God said, amen. amen.